Hello folks, I am Matt and this is Photo Syntech. Welcome to another episode of Meet the Grower. This week, Brian Waxman. He's from 303 Organic Cannabis and you may have seen him on the Future Cannabis Project uh, with his co-host Leighton Morrison talking about all sorts of great organic content. Brian, thank you so much for joining us today, sir. Well, I appreciate you guys having me and uh, yeah, Future Cannabis Project uh, we kind of go out of our way to promote living soil. So I'm excited to continue this process and start to educate uh, the people of Canada as well as uh, the world on what it really takes to cultivate cannabis using the microbial world instead of synthetics. Absolutely, 100%. And I am an absolute organic guy myself. Just finished mixing up the uh, living soil on the weekend there. Got a new 80 gallon fabric pot started and you guys will see that or on my channel anyway. Uh, most recent video talked about that sort of stuff. Anyway, we're not here to talk about me. We're here to talk about Brian and everything that he does regarding this great plant of ours. But before we get into your grow style and some of the stuff that you're doing in the garden, Brian, let's let's talk about who you are as a grower. Why don't you break down your life story for me in 60 seconds? Sure. Um, I grew up uh, lower middle class in um, Atlanta, Georgia. I was uh, decent at soccer and I was able to start to go around the, the world uh, on my soccer skills. Um, when I was out in Amsterdam and, and some of the other countries in Sweden, that's where I really was exposed to quality cannabis. That was the first time I ever saw what hash was. Um, I actually saw a bunch of other drugs and that kind of stuff, but I only partaked uh, on, the, on the hash and stuff. And that was the first time that I had ever really felt, um, I guess, that full punch of cannabis growing up in Georgia. Um, most of our stuff was seeded in brown. Um, so once I uh, came back to the United States, um, that was always in the back of my mind. Unfortunately, I got injured um, in soccer and my path kind of went in a different manner. I started hustling cannabis, trying to learn as much as I could about cannabis. Um, and that's where, you know, for the most part, you know, to keep it under 60 seconds, then I moved to Colorado. Uh, there were a lot of things in between that, but made it to Colorado and um, was able to not only teach myself um, how to cultivate cannabis, but I feel like I was able to continue to improve not only myself, but my family's life by continuing to educate them on the benefits of cannabis, because growing up in the South, uh, it was almost, um, we were definitely looked down upon um, being known as like the stoner kids uh, growing up. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that stigma still remains. And I hope as things move forward with uh, the removal of prohibition and legalization that we we see cannabis be recognized very similar to, say, beer or wine. So let's talk about your growth style. Obviously, organics, living soil. But did you start there? Have you always been into the living soil start of the, pardon me, the living soil side of things? Let's let's talk about how you how you started growing. Yeah, so um, I, I actually first started really cultivating cannabis um, in the same place that I'm talking from you right now. Um, I was uh, moved here to Colorado, you know, at a time a friend and I, uh, we dove right into it. We were trying to learn how to cultivate and we were sold by a salesman that the aeroponic system was the way to go. <laughs> uh, so we bought, uh, you know, the whole, the whole gamut, all the synthetics. Uh, we were flowering out plants that were maybe this, this big um, so that by the time, you know, we paid the labor, you know, we had our friends come over. We thought that we were going to be instant, you know, wealthy at this, at least. Um, and of course, when we started adding up all that stuff, our first two flips, we didn't even make any money. Uh, we lost money when you started, you know, paying the Excel bill and all that kind of stuff. So it was a, a kind of a kick in the teeth because we had put almost all of our money. I think it was um, like eighty five hundred bucks to get everything set up. Yeah. Um, so here we were with all our little. Uh, we had the, the biggest at the time, little aeroponic machine. We were running house and garden nutrients, um, the shooting powders, the whole gamut. We were kind of led to believe, especially at the grow stores, that, you know, the good cannabis was going to be grown by the, you know, by the synthetic nutrients that were the most expensive. Um, and, and sadly, that we believed that when we first started out. Uh, so that was one of the biggest issues that I think I had when I was first starting out is, um, you know, we were growing mids at best. And then as we yeah. continued on, um, you know, people are getting smarter. There's a lot more people that are starting to come in, into the cannabis market that might not have before with PhDs, botanists, all of that type of brain power started to come out. And of course, the cannabis level starts to improve. So I had to take a hard look at myself, look in the mirror and be like, all right, well, how am I going to be able to compete with people that are way smarter than me? 
Um, and that's when I started to find and, and get on YouTube. And I found uh, first I learned about Dr. Lane Ingham. I learned about yeah. the Soil Food Web. I uh, then um, started to educate myself through Jeff Lowenfeld's books. The first one being Teaming with um, Microbes. Yep, that book, book itself uh, really changed my life. Um, and then I continued educating myself on YouTube. And I found out uh, a video from the Mendo Dope Street Team. They interviewed this guy named Minnesota Nice. Um, and that was the, the aha moment for that me. turning was, point. Yeah, he was holding a little uh, solo cup and he had cover crop growing and he had a, a, you know, a pretty healthy looking clone. And uh, he was talking about how he was only using water to feed that clone. Yeah. Uh, and, and again, that kind of like blew my mind. And that's when I went down the real rabbit hole of trying to understand living soil. Um, it wasn't even called living soil back then. It was called no-till. That was yeah. like the, the buzzword. Um, but the real thing is, is that you're growing with microbes. You know, you're feeding the soil, not the plant. And that really is the difference. And that's why, um, you know, people that might not be as well educated. You know, I grew up in Georgia. Education really wasn't paramount. And you move out to Colorado, it's totally different. The parents are on. So just growing up in that mindset, I feel like I've had um, a little bit of a, a hindrance in a way, trying to catch up with a lot of these people that really understand the plant. Um, and that's when I, you know, when I started to trust the process, that's the best way to put it. Put it. When you start to trust the process, you know, you had a blue of green tank on here last week. You know, that's one of the things that, that we feel like, you know, running things like avocado tech, teaching the community, that's how you're going to be able to improve uh, and be able to compete with people or just, to, you know, grow the best cannabis that you can as a home grower. Oh, 100 percent, 100 percent. And for those watching, if you're not familiar with Blue, uh, the show that these guys did on the Future Cannabis Project, uh, I just I, I enjoyed it so much because Leighton and Blue were just feeding off each other. Yeah, and it was yeah. just wonderful to watch you guys who just really know their their stuff. And of course, there was the interview I did with Blue as well on my channel here on uh, Meet the Grower. So uh, I encourage you to go check that out um, and definitely learn about avocado tech. So, yeah, and I think, you know, the reason why we had him on the show as well is because we wanted to kind of clear up things like, uh, you know, I, I was working on Avocado Tech. I brought out like the very simple part of it. And then Tyler Blue, he took it to the next level. And that's definitely what I wanted the community to know is, um, you know, there's a two part system with that, but he definitely took it to the next level. Uh, and then definitely explaining it, you know, he makes he calls them pods and he's sticking around and stuff like that. Uh, so shout out to him because nobody in Denver was doing anything like that. We were just cutting them like a baked potato and getting the gumballs and that kind of thing. So uh, I want to make sure that the, the, you know, the community knows where credit is due. And he definitely deserves the majority of the credit for that. Yeah. A uh, stellar guy to talk to. Super charismatic individual. And, Laid uh, back too. That's what yeah. we like around here. Yeah, yeah, I hear you, man. Totally chill. Totally chill. So growing, of course doesn't necessarily always go the way that we want it to. Tell me about that time when things went completely off the rails and probably turned into a great learning experience, but was still what you'd consider your biggest failure as a grower. Yeah, my biggest failure, I would say, is um, when we were younger, is the ego. You know, we were probably two, two and a half years in, and we thought we knew everything A to Z. Yep. Um, and so, truth be told, we started having steak dinners. Um, then those steak dinners would go on a little bit longer and ah, we'll, get, we'll get to the grow in the morning. And then maybe we drank a little bit too much. So now, you know, we're not hitting that grow till midnight or um, till mid midday. Right. Yep. And so all these little things started to pile up. And then we were introduced what's lovingly known as a russet mite. And we didn't know what that was. So when we first saw that, we thought there were deficiencies. Yep. And so we were scrambling around trying to figure stuff out. Um, and then. Basically, we figured out what russet mites were after we've had a few of the, the gromies come over and kind of explain a few things. Some of them had no idea what it was. Uh, and then we actually had a buddy that came over. And at that point, he was able to take um, some of the flower and kind of lightly blow. Remember blow like the movie where she blows like that and the shit goes everywhere? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Remember that? Yeah. That, that's basically what I felt like. It looked like copper was just flying everywhere. And those were, to my knowledge, like trillions of russet mites. Um, and that was a heartbreaking moment for us because, yeah, you know, especially at that time, almost everything was riding on that grow. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and we we lost everything. So, uh, uh, yeah. yeah, there's education is huge, but um, remember that one. The biggest thing that I would want to give to a newer farmer is to remember to stay humble. 
Remember that the things that you are doing, especially if it's starting to come easy, continue to take that and ride with that. Continue your education um, because please learn from my mistakes that um, going out and, and having all of those luxuries is great. But if you continue that process, you're not going to be living that life for that long. It really is the work. Uh, we, we really believe in everyday counts around here. You know, you wake up with a purpose. You have an abundance mindset. I think that is a paramount for someone that um, wants to be an entrepreneur because nobody is, um, you know, there's no, no life coach or anything that's on the side, like cheering you on as an entrepreneur. You have to wake up every day and do that. And I view a cannabis farmer as an entrepreneur. So it's on you every day to make sure that you're in there in your grow room, you're in there touching your plants, you're in there making sure that that soil is starting to build so that things are improving week by week, month by month, and then eventually year by year so that you're starting to farm elite cannabis um, at a really a, a minimal uh, labor effort once everything starts to get dialed in. And that does take a little bit. Um, there's a little bit of upfront work, I would say, to build a living soil. But once those beds start to come alive and thrive, that's really when you're going to be able to, again, refocus on the canopy and continue to improve yield. Absolutely. Absolutely. So since we, we talked about russet mites and sorry to hear that happen, I mean, just tragic. Um, what, what do you do now for IPM? What's, what's your regular schedule like? So really the focus with living soil is that you're growing such healthy plants and you're using mother nature to combat mother nature that you're not really going to have an issue like that. An extreme would be a russet mite in the, um, in the, like the foiler section of the plant. And then um, a root aphid would be like a soil, uh, the equivalent of like a, a russet mite in the soil. So those two extremes, uh, sometimes you might have to start over, right? There, there's just a lot of issues with that. You might, there's a lot that could go into that. And I don't really want to go down that path unless you only want to talk about IPM, but there is definitely ways to combat that by making sure that the plant stays healthy. So obviously the cannabis plant can't run away. So how do we improve um, on mother nature? Well, we put our farmer brain on and we continue to improve that soil week after week, month after month. So we're using predatory mites. We're making sure that we're using um, beneficial nematodes, we're going after uh, hypiosis miles or the skidimus um, predatory mite. I'm focusing on breeding those rove beetles, breeding even the, uh, the white springtail mites so that there's enough food for that soil food web to continue to become alive and thriving. Yep. Remember, each one of those beds, each one of those fabric pots is going to be like a little utopia. And not all of those are going to be able to churn at the same rate. So it's up to you as the manager or as the mentor to make sure that you're coming in and managing everything. Um, for some people, I think it's hard with a living soil process to realize that you need to take a step back, that you're not really in charge so much anymore. The plant isn't so dependent on you to feed. It's not a week by week thing where, all right, you know, week one, I need to feed this. Week two, I need to feed this. With a living soil world, we're kind of replicating nature. We're kind of going back to the old growth forest, if you will, or at least that's what we're trying to replicate on a microcosm scale in our indoor facilities. So once we're um, getting that soil to churn, we're going to continue to feed that um, organic matter with fan leaves. We're going to continue to use certain amendments. We're going to make sure that we're focused on our calcium inputs because calcium only uh, is taken up through the transpiration stream. And once you're able to get that calcium going up, we're again going to put our farmer brain on, start to use amino acids to, in conjunction in a symbiotic relationship with that calcium. And you're going to see the overall health of your plant uh, improve dramatically. I truly believe that calcium is king and there's too many people that are starting out farming that think nitrogen is so important. And there's so many issues that you can have um, with nitrogen, um, nitrogen, not only uh, deficiencies, but just toxic nitrogen levels in general. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and you know, calcium as well as sulfur um, having to be considered because sulfur is so important later in flower. All the all the micro trace minerals. I mean, all that stuff. Oh is yeah, important. absolutely, absolutely. It's having the that. microbial world that's going to break all that down for you. They're communicating with the plant's roots, known as exudates. So that plant is dripping off these sugars. Dr. Lane Ingham calls them the cakes and the cookies of the microbial world, and that's going to attract the diversity 
of the compost of the microbial world to like the new compost that you just added. So if you're adding a different variety of compost, you're continuing to build up that soil system. Once that diversity starts to build up, that's where you're not going to really have to focus again on the IPM issues as much because the plant's going to be so healthy. You're focused on, um, you know, the predatory mites, uh, maybe spraying a, a couple things. Some people still spray like neem and stuff like that. I personally don't believe in that. Um, but there's still a variety of things that, that people do. I think the less that you're spraying, um, especially maybe just keep it in veg. And then once it gets into flower, maybe at, at most week two. Uh, but for the most part, I would, I would try only if you're going to foiler feed, uh, foiler feed and um, especially if you're a beginner in veg, uh, unless you really understand natural farming techniques, you can foiler feed late into flower with certain things. But again, that's on another level. And um, I would imagine, you know, I want to make sure I'm giving information for both sides, but uh, for the majority of you guys out there, stop foiler feeding um, during the veg cycle. Once it go, once it flips into the flower cycle. Yeah, well, that's that's great advice, Brian. Absolutely. So let's shift gears a little bit. Tell yeah. me about why your favorite grow room tool is your favorite grow room tool. All right. So I was thinking about it. my favorite grow room tool is Google. When I walk into Google and I, I mean, I walk into my grow room and I don't understand something. I go straight to Google or straight to YouTube. Um, and for the majority of the time, there's somebody out there that has made something. Um, you know, back in the day, there was even forums like Overgrow or um, IG Mag. So there's always information out there. Now, the beauty of the one thing I feel like that has come out of the fact that we've all been locked up is fantastic shows like your show or Peter's show, The Future Cannabis Project, a variety of other um podcasts and YouTube shows that have shown up and the quality of the people that are on there, like the quality of the guests that you've had on your show, you know, back in the day when we would have to ask each other uh, for information, again, you're asking a stranger on a forum, you don't know their name, everybody's still real secretive. And the reality is, is that sometimes you would ask them a question and they wouldn't get back to you for a few days. Yeah. And now you have this process, you know, with all of what's going on with virtual events and everything's more interactive where you can get a lot of these complex questions answered in real time. Um, and a lot of those times you can get them answered in real time from some of the people that you've looked up to your entire life, uh, which I really think is cool. You know, I mean, what other place really, um, what other industry really were some of the bigger name people where you can have, it seems like easier access to them. Uh, since, you know, a lot of the virtual stuff has come about and you're actually yeah. able to hear their experience. And I think that's what really is worth the time. And like we, like what we call the gold nuggets. And um, that's what I feel like a lot of the viewers, I'm sure your viewers are after is those little gold nuggets that they can take with them, apply to their um, process and then see for themselves again with the avocado tech. I mean, you can put that into your soil system, see that with your own eye within two weeks or less yeah yeah absolutely and i really like the term gold nugget uh and and just the takeaways because there's so many different youtube shows places to go and read and learn about it where we've got such an advantage now and because there's so much of it you can just pull those those little gold nuggets as you put from from many different places uh for example i was just learning about a technique called back building i don't know if you're familiar with back building but mm -hmm. what it is it's like topping your buds once they've reached about week five, the idea there to force the growth, the auxins back down to help spread out and uniform those buds up a bit, make them look nicer. It's not supposed to really increase yield. And I haven't tried it myself, but again, it's just, I was reading on a forum mm -hmm. something and I, I picked up that, that technique. So it's like, hmm, maybe that is something that works. And because we can share that sort of stuff out and have such availability to this knowledge now, I think it's making us all better growers. Absolutely. Or, you know, if, if you're not taking this knowledge in and applying it, then, you know, shame on you, because there are a lot of fantastic farmers out there that are breaking down. They even um, are showing their grows and that kind of stuff. I mean, that's next level for a new farmer. You know, Absolutely. when I first started farming, I had no idea that you'd be able to, to cultivate a plant all the way from veg to late into flower and have that plant hold praying leaves. Just so healthy that when you walked in there, it seemed like you know, there was like this, oh, like when you come in because <laughs> everything is just on point. And again, that comes back to the, the microbial world. It's not anything that really you're doing as the farmer. As long as you're managing everything, the plant, again, is going to take care of itself because it's communicating with the microbial world. So tell me then about a time when it all came together, the microbes, the environment, everything just worked perfect. And you had what you would consider your best grow. 
For me, it was when I started to understand the value of genetics. Um, for a long time, you know, just to be able to get a few clones or some quality seeds from a friend, they would tell you it was X, Y, Z. And after a while, you would grow certain things out and then you'd meet another friend that was close to you. And then they would tell you like, yo, that's fake. You know, I mean, there's just, as you would get older, there were certain things like we had a blue dream cut that comes to mind. That was definitely not a blue dreams cut. And we sold it for years as blue dreams, that kind of stuff. Yeah. So I wanted to get back to the basics, especially when we started to understand, you know, at this time we were just growing in soil. It definitely wasn't living soil, but we started to go more to fly out to other places uh, than just Colorado, go to these expos, go to the cups and that kind of thing. And just try to see more of the community, more of the vibe. Um, at that time, you know, we were, we were just in the crowd trying, trying to figure things out. And, you know, especially at that time, we were growing mids at best. So it wasn't like we had a ton of money in our pocket. So the goal, obviously, was to kind of change some of that. We started to understand the value of genetics. Uh, one gentleman that stood out for me at that time, his name was Bog. Unfortunately, he's just recently passed away. So, yes. you know, shout out to him and his family. That's unfortunate. Um, but bushy old grower, or bushy old guy, as some people would call him. Uh, was on the forums. He was definitely on the overgrow forums and stuff back in the day, giving out quality genetics. So I started to buy a few of those genetics. And for me, the one that really stood out was the one uh, named Blue Moon Rocks. And um, that was the first time when I really started to have everything start to come together because I was using worm bands. I started to build up my living soil systems. I was using genetics that were of a higher quality than just peers, you know, or getting them from Amsterdam in a t-shirt. You know, the reality is that a lot of that stuff was just watered down trash. Uh, when you really find fantastic genetics, shout out to Duke Diamond as well. When you find really good genetics, uh, that is again another aha moment because you're like, oh, okay. Uh, this is how some people are really able to, to grow that stuff is because they have, uh, you know, a, a fantastic canvas to start with. And so that's what uh, Boggs Genetics gave our little team was the ability to have those faint uh, pinks, those faint purples. Uh, with this one that actually had a nice little blue to it. And we started to notice that bag appeal was one of the main reasons that people were coming back to us. Yeah. So then we created this little motto that the only business was repeat business. And that is how we were going to be able to compete with the dispensaries here in Colorado. We had to have people that wanted to bypass all that. Obviously, you know, we were in the, the underground market at that time. Mm -hmm. So how do we get people to give a shit about us when it's so easy? They can even use a credit card and go to the dispensaries. And that's where we focused on quality. That's where we really focused on genetics. And that's where that aha that started to come um, to fruition for us was knowing that, okay, the competition, uh, at least right now on the commercial level, isn't at this level where they are. Oh. Lost uh, your second. Cut out there. Yeah, no, we're, that. we're back, we're back. You good? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, okay, okay. So, all right, <laughs> okay. Um, well, I, yeah, I'm not sure where we quite lost you. So, I guess talking then about genetics and stuff, and sorry, you said it was a Duke Diamond? Yeah, it's Duke Diamond. Shout out yeah, to him. He's I'm, uh, I'm unfamiliar. Opinion, one of the best breeders. Tell me a little bit about your okay, relationship so, with Duke uh, Diamond. So, uh, yeah, Duke Diamond, I would, I would say, is, you know, another one of those kind of like underground legends. I wouldn't necessarily say that he, a lot of his work is known in the dispensary space, uh, but it is sure known in the, you know, kind of like in the real world where you have to compete with everybody. And one of the reasons why Duke Diamond's gear is so sought after is because it's um, easy to pheno hunt. So if you're going out and you're getting, you know, 25 of his seeds, maybe, you know, you're able to go on a much larger scale, like a hundred seeds, uh, you're going to find something that is really, really unique. Case in point, uh, a good friend of mine lives in Oregon, shout out to Sasquatch 503. Uh, he's another guy that really believes in Duke Diamond's gear. He ran what was known as the Vulcan death grip uh, for Duke Diamond. It was in his vault. There were seven seeds that uh, Mr. Sasquatch bought from Duke. He pheno hunted those uh, seven seeds within those seven, he told me he found four that he felt were keepers, two that he really felt like would take your face off. Um, and that is to the till this day, my favorite uh, cannabis to dab. It is straight to the face. It smells like pine saw. I mean, it is 
uh, for, for somebody that, that likes to dab and probably dabs too much and, you know, kind of has too much of a tolerance, that's still one of those that is straight to the face every single time. Uh, we actually had a, um, an event a couple of years ago here in Denver, Colorado. Duke was the keynote speaker and I asked Sasquatch to come out because we were, you know, we're all, uh, we all believe in what he's doing. We're all friends. And so Sasquatch came out, brought the Vulcan death grip and you should have seen the faces, you know, we're in Colorado. People was People, people partake know. yeah, um, and they just weren't able to. So that's again, where I feel like genetics is really important and it's a case in point with him because he was able to get something that no, literally no one else has. Uh, he's able to then uh, cultivate that on a superior uh, method and then create a product that, you know, to this day, that's something that I still reach out to him for. I mean, it's, it's, it's so unique that, it, you know, you remember it. I really do feel like that is what cannabis brands really should be after is allowing their um, their team to find those phenos that are going to build a brand around themselves, not just always grow the next hype or try to grow the the better blue dreams and the better go golden go kind of stuff uh, than the next dispensary. No, that's that's some really good points there, and having those key genetics absolutely absolutely important when when starting a new grow. So, what do you feel people are not doing enough of when they're they're growing cannabis what what should they be doing more of uh, i think i don't you know there are a lot of people you know people that are probably reviewing this people that are on youtube viewing that kind of stuff those people i'm not really talking to but i would say the majority of the people out there i feel like have this arrogance to them after they've been cultivating for a year or two myself included, like I was sharing before, I think it comes about like after two or three years, you kind of settle in with things. And so if you can minimize that, humble yourself, remember that, you know, you're just kind of creating this journey on your own. You know, you think of it as a four year deal, if you will. So if you're only in your sophomore year, you know, you're not there yet kind of thing. Um, and if you hold that mindset, I think you're going to be a lot more successful. The majority of the, some of the consulting work and stuff I've done over the years is usually from people that are at that point uh, that got lazy that tried to mix up their system, started to add on, as Leighton Morrison always calls the moron issue, where they continually put more things on, more amendments. They have a little bit of a, some kind of deficiency, so they put more kelp on or something that they think is going to be the magical thing, um, and they continue to have issues. So I think one of the main things is to, again, trust the process. So if you're going to focus on living soil, know that you're just focused on building your worm bins, you're being proactive, you're creating those worm bins, you're creating those castings before you ever put a plant into the ground. And as long as you're staying proactive, you're going to be able to take those castings, take that soil food web, take that soil inoculant, put that into your uh, um, fabric pots, into your raised beds and inoculate those systems as you move down. As long as you're staying proactive, you should have enough uh, to continue to inoculate that. Uh, Dr. Lee Ningham talks about how it takes about three weeks, 21 days for that inoculant to really start to take hold. So again, this is a process. If you just take um, brand new soil, you throw some uh, biology on it, you don't even really know what's going on there. You just throw that on there and then you throw your plants in there. The, the soil system is not going to keep up with the plant. You're going to have deficiencies. That's when I see a lot of people that end up calling us or calling somebody else that's a, a consultant and is asking them like, what's going on in my grow? A lot of that time is there's some kind of nutrient lockout. They're being too aggressive or this, the cannabis plant is a hungry girl herself. So she needs a thriving system just to keep up. So if you're starting everything from scratch, she's not going to keep up. You're going to have a horrible first grow. So the main thing I would say is to educate yourself and remember that cannabis farming is, is about being proactive. These are chess moves. For a lot of us, this is how we feed our family. So we can't make mistakes. We can't be throwing interceptions and stuff like that constantly, right? So if we focus on that, we are a team, we have a quarterback, and we're going to continue to throw the ball in the right direction, um, you're going to continue to have success. And a lot of those guys out there that do stay focused and, and do stay humble, they are the ones that are creating some of the most fantastic product that, you know, that I've seen. And, and a lot of this stuff, again, is all solventless you know, closed loop systems. So, you know, one guy created the whole thing that did not exist when I first started growing. I, yep. to this day, don't know how to do all that, you know? So it's a whole new world of these, these younger uh, guys coming up and I applaud them because they understand this on a whole nother level. Um, and I, I would imagine as they continue to get older, uh, they will pass that torch in a way. And that's why I think education is so important. And that's why I go out of my way, just like you do, to try to educate 
so that other people can see that you don't have to farm just with synthetics. And the reality is, is if you really believe in cannabinoids and terps and, and profiles that are going to be remembered, um, you're going to have to educate yourself on a botanist level to get it to that level where you're using pharmaceutical grade synthetics and you're just on a whole nother level than most farmers. Or you're going to be like, uh, I feel like us, the, the humble grower, the humble farmer realize that you're not that smart, man. Right. And then so if I can't keep up in that way, I got to find another way. I got to find my own lane. And for me, my own lane was understanding the microbial world. Yeah, 100 percent. And, you know, I just to touch off what you're saying there and it's fantastic advice especially for people starting out is don't reinvent the wheel don't don't try and build your own soil system yourself do lots of reading see what other people are doing see what's working well for others uh you know i've recently come around to the build a soil way of doing things and having experimented then with their recipes for the last couple of months been very very pleased with what i'm getting out of it because i'm i'm looking to somebody who has the knowledge the experience Experience and just taking their learnings instead of trying to just do it myself. But then at the same time, don't try to or don't stop experimenting because if you're not trying to constantly change and well, grow as a grower, then you know you're you're not gonna achieve the best that you can. So next point, then, uh, what do you think industry could be doing more of to help the home grower? What could the industry do to help the home grower? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. Yeah, I, I really think that the industry, to be as blunt as possible, doesn't really give a shit about the home grower. Mm -hmm. um, they don't really make money off the home grower. Uh, for the most part, you know, they realize that they used to teach us how to grow. The, the, only, the only really way back in the day, if you weren't on um, forums and that kind of thing, was they had pamphlets. They had week by week guides to grow synthetically. But there was nobody, I assure you, in the grow store that was teaching you that you could go to a a grocery store and get certain ingredients. So I feel like the industry as a whole has um, let us down as cannabis farmers, has kind of, you know, pillaged, if you would, um, knowing that they've preyed off of the ignorance that we had for a long, long time. There are certain brands to this day that I just have disdain for, um, especially when I see certain people that, for whatever reason, maybe they don't know, but there are certain companies out there that are horrific to the cannabis farmer that are still touted as supposedly in our industry. Um, so I think I also want uh, people to understand like where we all come from in the, in the industry. And if you are a home grower, you kind of need to know that stuff so that you, you know, in a way you're voting with your dollars. So please, you know, I don't want to, my personal opinion is my personal opinion. So, you know, go out yeah, there for yourself, yeah. go and um, research what companies uh, kind of shit all over the community. It's not hard to figure that stuff out. And you can see for yourself, you can see usually, you know, when you go to some of these high-end expos, the MJ BizCons and stuff, I mean, there's a lot of those brands just don't have that same fire behind them anymore. And I think that's because of the community as a whole is starting to realize that they got ripped off for years. And there's a, another way to farm cannabis and there's a community that's willing to teach one another, um, you know, with, without charging anything. Like everything that's on YouTube and all that, you know, no, nobody can make money from cannabis stuff on YouTube as far as I know. There's no way to monetize that. It is very difficult. Um, one of the first uh, episodes of Meet the Grower that we did, I uh, had Mr. Grow It on, and he's found a path to doing it. Um, but he is very, very careful about the language that he uses, sure. the images that he shows. He, he educates but he he has to step around it and I, I applaud him for what he's doing because he's he's helping get the message out there otherwise but it's it's such a punishment for the can of creator because as i'm sure you know uh if we're not careful they'll just ban us outright and and yeah. that's it you're done so, and it's the same thing on all the platforms yeah you know, I've, I've had good friends that worked hard that gotten their instagram accounts deleted and all that stuff i mean really where else are you going to be able to show off your brand other than Instagram? So, you know, it's devastating for some of these brands. That's why I think hopefully in time, you know, in these next five years, uh, I think things will start to ease up a little bit and hopefully we'll at least be able to promote things on social media, at least. I mean, we already are for the yeah. most part. Um, so that leads me into my next question. Then where do you see the fight for prohibition in the States in the next year or the next five years for that matter? 
I think it all comes down in reality to money. So as these states mm-hmm. really start to see that, hey, this is just an easy way to, and, and I feel like as certain demographics start to view things differently so that they're allowed to actually voice the real opinion, I think uh, the majority of people are gonna see the cam- cannabis as a whole is pretty harmless. Um, it's it's kind of silly to make it out as a reefer madness type of thing. And so they should tax it just like they do. Um, you know. Is it the best way, you know, especially here in Colorado, you know, I've also been out in Oklahoma. There's definitely a lot of things that could be improved on that process. Um, but I'm not, uh, I'm not in, in that space enough. We, I feel like uh, my buddy, even on the other side here, Daguerre and myself, we got involved with Denver Normal here in Denver. We were trying to understand the political process and it was eye opening to us when we would walk in there. Now these people are making decisions on policy here in Denver, Colorado, and they're asking us in real time what the difference is between cannabis and marijuana. So that was the kind of- uh, Yeah. Well, and there's been so much miseducation and and misdirection around the subject that I feel like we definitely have some some years to go, but as long as we continue to stay true to our message and, and preach that organic cannabis and just, you know, that sustainability is the way to go, we'll get there eventually. If we can get their ear and, and show them that there's other ways to cultivate cannabis that, you know, when I first started cultivating here in Colorado, the basically the SOP for the, the company that I worked for was to dump all the extra nutrients down the drain, which is a huge no-no, obviously. Yeah, but there was no regulation back then. There was nobody checking what we did. We sprayed Avid and Forbid. We sprayed Myclobutanol, which is known as Eagle 20, late into flour. That is a huge no-no. You add uh, heat to that, that turns into a cyanide. We're, this is supposed to be a medical facility that, you know, we're, we're cultivating cannabis for medical patients, especially back then. I'm an old man. So especially back then, this wasn't just you know, everybody was just, ha ha, we had a medical card. This was legit back then. It was kind of hard to get that kind of stuff. And yeah. here we are, you know, growing the, the worst trash out there. Well, fortunately, as things continue to get legalized and more research is done, we're going to see even less of that sort of thing start to happen. 100%. So to bring things back to a bit of a lighter tone, let's talk about <laughs> your favorite strains to grow yourself. I know we talked a little bit uh, about some of the, the stuff that your your friend Sasquatch had done, but what do you prefer to grow? Yeah, so I like, um, you know, a lot of the tried and true genetics. Um, I am obviously a big fan of Duke Diamond's gear, but I have kind of ventured out. Um, I've grown some of uh, Ethos genetics. Are you familiar with them, Colin? I, uh, I I've heard the name. I haven't I haven't tried his seeds, but no, I, I, I've definitely heard the name. Um, and then, you know, there's other genetics out there that I, I've had some success with. And I feel like some of my other friends have with uh, Capulator's gear. We were growing the Mac. We were running out the Mac mm-hmm. and cheese. There were definitely some things that stood out to it. Uh, Onai's, Tropicana cookies, you know, especially for washing. It, the genetics that I enjoy are going to be whatever gets the job done. I enjoy growing a variety of different plants, but... I feel like as as I've progressed in this, I've had to realize that when you're farming cannabis, it's not really about me. It has to be more about like, what do people want? And sadly, sometimes it's stuff that you wish you didn't have to farm. It's stuff that is just, in your opinion, it's kind of like whatever. Uh, but if people are willing to purchase that, then I'm, I'm obviously the team is going to farm that. Um, so we would continue to, to grow some of the hype stuff, but we would try to find stuff um, like, uh, my buddy here in Colorado, his name's Mountain Ross. He had this, um, like, um, like, I forget the name. It was like a, basically like a purple cush, like a dark purple yeah. cush. So we ran through that. Uh, I think we had over a hundred seeds. I think we found maybe eight or nine, uh, keepers that we ran through and we were able to find, um, you know, I'm sure the audience kind of knows this, but when you're running, uh, purple genetics for the most part, it just doesn't have that same punch as any kind of, uh, like normal cannabis. And so the real goal when we first started out was to farm something that we liked that, um, especially in a new market in Oklahoma, that had that purple bag appeal color, but also had the trichomes and the punch to it. Um, and that was something that I enjoyed growing out because it, nobody, had, as far as I understood, I bought all of his genetics. He wasn't, um, you know, breeding anymore at that point. That's the kind of stuff that I personally like to do is try to find the stuff that I know nobody's going to get. Uh, stuff that maybe no one's ever heard, uh, like a gentleman, Genome Alchemy here in Colorado. There's a ton of people that are probably here in Colorado that have heard of his work, but for the most part, outside of Colorado, they might not have ever heard of that gentleman. 
uh, but his gen genetics are absolutely out of this world. Uh, he's even won, um, there's a gentleman named Sticky Lungs. They had a build a soil event for like a living soil cup. Gino Malcolm, he won that event. Um, and then shout out to AJ from Build a Soil Growing Organic. He won it the next year, uh, both gentlemen that understand living soil. So I think, um, you know, when you when you take these kind of products and, you, and you're able to uh, have them judged at the level that Sticky Lungs had at his event, I think that's where people are starting to see. And now the customers are starting to keep up as well on why uh, not only breeders, but cannabis farmers in general are wanting to start from day one using a living soil. That's awesome. That's awesome. So what are you currently working on then? What, what do you have in the grow? So currently right now we are working on building soils. Um, yep. And I'm actually um, deviating more into what's known as the isopod world. We've, we've gotten more into designer osteopods. So we're breeding isopod substrates. Yep. Um, and then as we continue down the line, I would like to get back into farming cannabis. Uh, but right now I have uh, my two children and that kind of thing. So it's not exactly uh, ideal for where I, where I currently live. No, no, understandable. Uh, being a dad is a whole new responsibilities, of course. Oh, I love it. And I, you know, it, one of the hardest things for me was to the transition from, you know, that, that other side of the world to this legal world. But it is so much more rewarding when, um, you know, you don't, you're able to come home, kiss your kids, that kind of thing, and not have to look over your shoulder, that kind of stuff. So, yeah, it's... Um, it's been a long grinding mountain, but uh, I feel like a lot of us are, are starting to see the mountaintop. So right on, right on. So what product do you think everybody should be using? What, what kind of stuff would you like to endorse? Um, I would say when you're going out of your way to get um, quality compost. So, you know, if I was going to get out there, I would get like, like a bison compost. I would get a mushroom compost. I would make my own worm castings. I would make sure that I'm, uh, you know, we lovingly like to use the four horsemen of the composting world. So I think going out there and using products like things that are going to continue to make you more money, make you more um, amendments. So buying composting worms, feeding them organic matter, obviously they're going to make you um, earthworm castings. Earthworm castings at the grow store are extremely expensive, especially if you're starting out a new grow. Yeah. So again, this comes back to being proactive. Just a few thousand worms in a, in a raised bed or maybe 500 in a fabric pot, um, allow that to break, you know, allow them to kind of move around for a week or two, then you can implement the avocado tech. The worms are going to gum, gumball up. It's kind of like the fav famous little photo op. Um, and once those start to gum up, there's gonna be a lot of biofilm that's built. And once that starts to create and they break down that avocado, they're going to continue to move around the uh, soil medium. And once they start to break down everything else in that soil medium, there's going to be the springtail mites that hitch on predatory mites, soil mites that are going to, to hitch on to that composting worm. And they're going to build those dissolved oxygen channels. So for me as a living soil farmer, the products really should be what is going to continue to make me money. How can I cultivate and, and grow superior cannabis for pennies on the dollar compared to conventional methods. So the real product that I would say that I would still purchase to this day is something called um, Full Power by uh, BioAg. Uh, it's been known as um, like an OGs have always called it like sunshine in a bottle. Mm -hmm. And I do feel like if you know, you're newer to farming, you're having some issues with some clones or maybe your veg isn't up to par, um, I would use that product. So that would be a product that I guess I would endorse. But for the most part, man, I want everybody to be farming at the grocery store or yeah. going you know, to their worm bin and creating new things. I feel like that's, uh, that's where you're going to be able to create those terpene profiles that are next level. Yeah, 100%. Stay away from the big bottle nutrients and go get that giant bag of rice hulls from the brewery store. I just picked up 50 pounds of them yesterday for $50, and that's going to last me a long time. Right on. <laughs> yeah, There's Marco. Sure. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of him. He's on Instagram. Marco uh, Microbes, I think is his name on Instagram. But mm -hmm. he, he always talks about how bottles are for babies. Um, and so I want to I want to kind of say there is a there is a little bit of a point to that is because, you know, the, 
if you're using a lot of that stuff, I mean, some of that stuff really is training wheels. I mean, yeah, really well, no magic to it. And the stuff's going to, you're going to have a variety of different genetics that you're growing. And unless again, your knowledge and skill set is upper level, most of that stuff is going to smell and, and taste the same. Yeah. I think the thing about synthetics, synthetics is it's approachable and it's easy for people starting out to, uh, to understand and work with because it's very much a one, two, three type recipe. Whereas with organics, there can be that, that learning curve that you have to really sort of work through. But then to that point, uh, I'll bring up build a soil again and what they have on their website is just excellent, excellent information. So if you are looking to start out, you know, maybe you stay away from those bottles and see what you can do about starting out your own living soil. And it's not that difficult. So last question, Brian, because we've been going here for a little while. Um, what do you yeah, think is this. the next big thing for cannabis? The next big thing I think yeah. is really understanding terpenes. You mm -hmm. know, for a long time we were talking about, uh, I thought that the, the vocabulary would have been like bricks, bricks levels. I feel like that got to a point. Uh, but for now, I feel like the consumer is starting to realize that there is a um, drastic difference and, and some people's cannabis. And so, you know, once you start to see the difference in high quality cannabis, um, the consumer themselves just doesn't want to go back unless it's, you know, value type kind of stuff. And so I really feel like that is going to be the main difference. Yeah, no, that's, that's an excellent point there. And as people start to really enjoy what organics can do and how they can develop those terpenes uh blue and his new trick uh, that he's been working on uh of introducing terpenes from like type uh fruits for example uh yeah. using peaches to try and bring out a peach terpene more in uh in cannabis for example just very interesting ideas interesting work and like i say as people get to experience that that new type of high that that better more flavorful entourage effect they're going to definitely want to come back for more. And I feel like that is the future. I mean, I know that's yeah. kind of like a, uh, duh, but you know, the, the majority of people out there still, I don't think they've really tasted high quality, like from an <laughs> Emerald cup, uh, you know, entry or something like that, where you just have a, uh, a variety of fantastic farmers, all there showing and, and sharing their cannabis, you know, even in the, the high cup, high times cup in Oklahoma, uh, that cannabis was horrific. I don't know if, if you've ever been to any no, of those events and stuff. But so again, there's, I mean, there's just, you almost have to go to certain places to really experience some of this high-end cannabis if you've never seen that before. But once you've seen that, I feel like it's going to be hard to go back to brick weed or seeded weed. Um, well, absolutely. Or if you've just grown it yourself. I, I know personally my, my first real organic grow changing over from, from synthetics, it, it was night and day. And then again, like you mentioned, the entourage effect. I mean, the the goal really for us, especially we have, you know, I have CBD right here and I have THC obviously right here. So I, I feel like I want to use that as a, as a medicinal aspect and I'm able to sit here, have a conversation with you and, and also be high, which, you know, um, I don't think a lot of people are able to, to enjoy cannabis at that level yet. They, you know, especially back in, you know, my hometown in Georgia, they still use it as, you know, let's get as high as possible. Let's that, that kind of mindset where I feel like I enjoy, I enjoy being stoned, but I still want to be pro, you know, productive and, and being proactive in, in my life. So I continue to use that CBD to kind of balance things out. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's the best thing about it as, as we continue to, explore you know new strains new cultivars uh, legalization continues to get out across not only the us but the rest of the world we're all going to be able to benefit from this uh, great medicine that much more so brian i think that's going to be uh, our, our interview for today thank you so much for joining us uh, why don't you tell the people who are watching how to find you online yeah absolutely um you know for the most part i'm on instagram it's uh, 303 organic cannabis uh, also on there is 303 OC Media, and we're on uh, live every Thursday on the Future Cannabis Project, Leighton Morrison and myself, along with Peter and Daguerre Forge of Melavora. Uh, he's the gentleman that sets up all the uh, high tech uh, stuff that you see me on each week. Um, I also want to give a shout out to uh, Mr. Diamond. He's um, right now incarcerated, so shout out to him. Uh, he'll be home soon. 
And then I also wanted to give a shout out to everybody that's involved with uh, learnlivingsoil.com. I appreciate everybody that's been a part of that. Um, you know, we're, our goal is to educate people. And one of the easiest ways to do that is to try to get the best and brightest minds in one in one area. Uh, and that's what we've been doing, um, you know, it's going on like four or five months now. And that's that's a course that you guys offer to learn how to create your own living soil, isn't it? Uh, yes, we have a course with that, but we also have um, some of the best and brightest minds like like Dr. Elaine Ingham. We had her, um, you know, uh, Kevin Jaudry. I don't know if you are familiar with some of these oh, yeah. names, but, you know, some of the, the that way, you know, you don't have. a. I feel like if you're a new farmer, there's just too much noise out there. There's a lot of bro science. You know, there was a lot of misinformation that was given to me that I screwed up, you know, Mm-hmm. someone told me like quick example, they told me to put a bunch of humidity laid into flour. That's how you got terpenes to improve. Mm-hmm. Obviously all I did was add powdery mildew to myself and killed the entire grow. So I want to make sure that there are people out there, especially the newer viewers, the newer farmers where you guys are getting, you know, the, the benefit that I want to make sure that, the, you know, you're getting the gold nuggets. And so we've gone out of our way to get the upper echelon soil scientists um, and just cannabis farmers in general to, you know, take two hours of their time and explain things um, so that you're able to watch that on a whole nother level. And that's really the goal is to um, educate now with uh, everything being virtual uh, and being on the Future Cannabis Project. It's gone from just being able to hold events in Denver, Colorado, to then being able to do a few things nationwide to now we're able to have almost a global voice, which is, is pretty cool. Absolutely. Absolutely. These are wonderful times we live in, sir. Brian, absolutely. thank you so much for taking the time to speak yeah, with man. me today, man. Absolutely enjoyed chatting with you. And hopefully we can do it again in the future and maybe bring a few more people on as well. Otherwise, I am Matt and this is Photosyntech. Brian Waxman, check him out on Instagram. Make sure you, you uh, check the Future Cannabis Project out on Thursdays for uh, his show as well. We out.